Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. And Mr Ryan, I'm sensing some alpine air. Yes, we're back at Alton, one of Mount Macedon's most important hill station gardens, yes. to have a look at something else. Oh, and what might that be? But before you tell us, you might want to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Exactly. So you can know exactly what we're doing week on, week on. We post every Friday, so Stephen, <laughs> What are we looking at today? We're going to look at Alton's old productive garden. So there's a greenhouse here that's probably the only one of its type in Australia. Yes. And a vegetable garden, all a bit shabby chic now, but it's still <laughs> worthwhile having a look at uh, and to get a sense of the history. Who doesn't love a shabby chic greenhouse? Let's yes. go and have a look. All right, fantastic. <laughs> oh, here we are in what can only be described as uh, i'm an orchid grower this is an orchid grower's dream oh my goodness it's the size of a large family house it is and it's probably one of the few in australia of this style of greenhouse mm. it's actually a lean-to greenhouse and yet it's freestanding which yeah. if that makes any sense so it has a large brick wall along one side then it has a skillion roof that comes down so can i ask you the brick wall practically would have been about heats uh, yep. absorption and um, radiation. Yes, it would have. And this would have been the hub of the garden. Yeah. They would have raised all their seedlings here yes. because you've got to remember these places were quite isolated back from the 1920s and earlier because yes. this garden started in about the uh, 1870s. Yeah. But in its heyday in the 1920s, they would have had a huge garden staff here. Mm. They would have raised all of the vegetable seedlings to go out into the vegetable garden. And the, the seed raising beds are here, which we'll yep. show you. Yep. And they would have, of course, uh, raised a lot of tree seedlings and plants, cuttings, all those sorts of things to go back into the garden. Yes. And of course, the staging that's behind us, this dramatic staging, would have been used to grow large potted plants on. So it would have had possibly orchids, palms, uh, flowering plants like calcellaria, uh, cyclamen in mm. season. All those Edwardian fashionable yep. plants, drawing room plants. Exactly. And then when the family came up to stay for the summer, because they basically only ever came up to these houses in the summer mm. as a summer retreat from the heat of Melbourne, yep. they would have had beautiful plants to sit in the parlour or to cut for vases or all that sort of thing. And some poor little apprentice or young boy would have had to scramble up this staging, which goes up to probably about, about four or five metres high, with a watering can in hand and virtually daily water the pot plants and probably do the deadheading and the cleaning and yes. all that sort of thing. Uh, so it would have been quite an amazing thing to see in its heyday. So there's there's an evocative sense of the past just down there. There's some cymbidium orchids in pots. We're going to have a look. But so my first question is, when do you think this was built? All right. Well, I'm not dead sure exactly when, but it would have been early last century. So mm. sometime around about the 1920s or maybe a little earlier. So it's not an original part of the garden. Yes. I have to say, though, this greenhouse does have a National Trust classification on it. Uh -huh. And there's been an enormous amount of work done on it, renovating both the staging, which was starting to fall apart, mm. and also the ceiling and reglazing. Uh, and so it's actually in very good condition, ready to go again. Oh, really. I know, but hopefully the owners will fill it with beautiful things because it's just the most sensational space. So the obvious thing is the grape vine or vines, mm -hmm. yes. which are They've actually got little grapeplets growing now, but they're, they're the most beautiful plants giving us this dappled light. What is the history of the grapevines? Do you well, think? they date right back to the beginning of this greenhouse. So mm. they would be at least 1920s or earlier. Yeah. Uh, we don't know what cultivars they are, but they make very good table grapes. Mm. And they would have been ripe just when the owners were up here to spend their summer holidays. Mm. So not only would they have lovely flowers for the house, pot plants for the house, but they would also have some lovely fresh grapes to go on the breakfast table as well. And I think perhaps to, to put this in context for viewers outside of Australia, in Australia generally, you don't need greenhouses because it's hot and sunny yep. enough. So this is actually much more of, a, of, a, of an English style greenhouse really, isn't it? It is. I mean, you've got to remember that we're nearly a thousand metres above sea level here. Mm. It gets very crisp and cold in the winter, as we can attest. Uh, we, we can, because we did a beautiful video about the garden before. And and in fact, the mist, this is like um, um, a wing song. The mist is rolling in, not from the sea, but from the 
from the valley and it's actually quite misty and it's midsummer now but anyway yeah midsummer misty fairly typical of mount Macedon, i have to say so a greenhouse was really quite important in a garden like yes. this if you're going to have a family full of people here plus the staff because Funnily enough, they had to be fed as well. Yes. So you had all those people that you were feeding. Now, although there was the possibility of bringing certain food in, but they would have had their milking cow, they would have had their chickens for, for eggs, mm. uh, the full vegetable garden thing, so all their, all their vegetables would have been grown here. Their berries would have been grown here, so there's even remnant beds of raspberries and gooseberries and Which sundry we'll, other things We'll outside. go and have a look at that in a minute. Uh, mm. And so they would have been as self-sufficient as possible. Mm. So there would have been staff members particularly allocated to look after this part of the garden and then there would have been others who would have been uh, in charge of the ornamental part of the garden. And what I can see is piping and when we walked in well there's firstly there's a chimney there and there's um, what looks like a boiler so yep. this was heated I presume by a wood-fired heating system. Wood-fired uh, that heated up hot water that then right. went through the pipes so that uh, they could keep things going through the winter here. You would probably have had stove-grown tomatoes in here right. that would have kept going later into the season if you wanted to. Uh, and, of course, they'd be growing all of their uh, annual plants in pots during the winter months, ready to be used for the summer. Because climatically, we're uh, almost at the top of Mount Macedon, so it does snow up here, yep. and it certainly gets frost, and it's certainly sub-zero uh, Celsius. Yeah. A lot in winter. Although those of you in Switzerland would laugh at us, of course. But it's anyhow. a balmy tropical climate. <laughs> yes, exactly. So all things, uh, you know, are in perspective to the country we're in. Mm. And Australia is not renowned for its colder climates, but this could be one of them. Indeed. And generally, obviously, when you're not at altitudes in Australia, it's shade houses that you're building, not greenhouses. Exactly. But this is a great example of its type uh, and one of the few in the country. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to share it with our And we're viewers. very lucky because it's a private residence and it's not open. So mm. we are very lucky and very grateful to the gracious owners of Alton for letting us come and film today. We should go and have a look, though, at the productive garden. And you can give us some ideas about what yeah. happened there. All right. Let's go outside let's and do that. Let's have a look. And it really does remind me of that uh, amazing greenhouse in Hampton Court with the ancient grapevine. Obviously, this is not as old. Nor as splendiferous. No. But let's go out and have a look at the productive garden. Let's. But the funny thing is, the mist has rolled in. <laughs> <laughs> you almost can't see a thing. Yeah, well, Heathcliff is out there somewhere. I'm Heathcliff! Sure <laughs> Um, there are some young grapevines here, or youngish. They were planted probably about a decade or so ago. Yep. I'm not sure what varieties of uh, vines have been put in, but I guess there's the possibility of a high altitude wine of some sort or another. Well, let's have a look. All right. If you can see anything, can you see the fog? Yeah, it's outrageous, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Ryan, we're like we're gorillas in the mist. When do you think these grapevines were planted? Uh, they're probably a decade, decade and a half oh, old. So not that old. So no. do you think there would have been grapes in the original garden? Uh, I think only the grapes in the greenhouse. Uh, they're table grapes. They need more heat. Mm. These obviously are some sort of wine grape with the sort of idea that maybe we'd have our own vintage. Do you think there ever has been a vintage from these grapes? I'd be very surprised. Uh, I think it's really pushing grapes beyond what they should be. Well, put look into. at today. It's midsummer, and honestly, I feel like we're in the Scottish Highlands in October. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's sort, beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely, and it's sort of fun to have the vines. But I think that a lot of these properties, things are done for the look and not necessarily for the long-term value. Because you know, it's all very well to have grape vines, but you. You'd sort of need to be in a warmer climate if you were ever going to make that nice Pinot Noir or whatever. Yes, and it's a lot of work, isn't it? I mean, a lot mm. of practical work in terms of the staking and the, the looking after them and then just gardening work mm. in terms of maintaining plants. It's called a folly. <laughs> <laughs> so should we go further down the slope and look at some of the other productive gardens? Why not indeed? So what are we standing in now? <laughs> well, this is the berry area of the garden. Yes. As in berries, not as in buried. Uh, and 
<laughs> the pet cemetery. Yeah, the pet cemetery. This area of the garden would have been productive right back in the old days because mm. berries were one of those things that people saw as an, a necessary luxury if you were coming up to the hills. So we've got gooseberry plants that would have been used to make gooseberry jam and gooseberry fool and gooseberry everything else that you can make out of gooseberries. Yes. There are big patches of raspberries, both probably early cropping and later cropping. Yes. There are boysenberries. There are red currants. So there's a whole range of different varieties of berries here. And I have to say, as much as they would have been fantastic to have at the time, mm. when you think about it, if you're sending the garden staff out to pick them, uh, to bring them in for the table, yes. they're not the cheapest way of having fruit for the table, no. but it's lovely and fresh and I'm sure everybody appreciated it. And is it fair to say, do you think berries were particularly Edwardian, the gooseberries and the raspberries and, I mean, people still grow strawberries and raspberries, yep. but I think sort of gooseberries and red currants are a bit more old fashioned. Do well, people they still are, grow them they, much? Look, I think people are still growing that sort of uh, berry, mm. but it was sort of the the epitome of good gardening back then. I mean, way back before the turn of the last century, there were nurseries that had 35 or 40 different varieties of gooseberries that you could buy. Really, really? I mean, there's probably no more than five or six these days if you're really lucky. How interesting. And so this, fruits yeah. can go out of fashion as well as other oh, yeah. plants. Yeah. There was a nursery in the area here back in the 1890s uh, called Smith's and they had a list that had sort of 25 or 30 different cherries. They had, you know, 25 different gooseberries they had wow. 10 different rhubarbs they you know they had this enormous array of cultivars which unfortunately have largely disappeared died away yeah how sad it's so romantic i mean it is slightly overgrown because the garden um the vegetable garden isn't maintained at the moment but a lot of these these plants are covered in in fruit just waiting to be eaten with jam and cream and God yes. knows what else i could be up here with a bucket before you know it do I see before me a wall of figs, Stephen Ryan? You do. You see. There is a whole row of figs against the wall of the greenhouse. Is a fig in Mount Macedon ever going to do anything? I doubt it will this year because it's so cool. Yeah. And I don't As think... As you can it, see. Yeah, I don't think they have many years where they've got decent figs on them. Mm. Although, having said that, they're getting to quite a good size. So, who knows? Maybe this year will be uh, a fig year. And they're against a brick wall. So, you imagine there's quite a bit of radiated heat from the brick. Would well, that when, have been... <laughs> when the sun comes out. <laughs> Was that why they were planted against the brick wall? Yeah. Yeah, to give them that little bit of extra shelter at this altitude. Yeah. And I would imagine when they were first planted, they were probably even pruned heavily against the wall so they were mm. kept back as espalier plants mm. they've been let go in recent years but whether they get crops of figs very often is a moot point but they look quite good they do well let's move on all right let's go so this is the original vegetable garden yes this is the main body of the productive vegetable garden yes. uh, one has to say it could do with a little tender loving care at the moment but you can still see there are things i mean i can see what look like garlic and you said this is sorrel yes we've got the french sorrel there's um, garlic there's purple mustard greens there's quite a lot of things that are self seeding potatoes <laughs> yes there's potatoes there's pyrethrum there's all sorts of things chicory Ooh, i can see over there and thyme yes and thyme growing ah. here so there you go so the basics are all here mm. i have to say there's a rudely productive batch of um, jerusalem artichokes behind us they will be quite a monster to deal with in due course and an awful lot of soup so given that this was a summer residence what would have the sort of things been growing here in the 1920s when this was at its heyday well, the gardeners would have planted things that they wanted to eat as well, of course. Remember, they're going to be here 12 months of the year. Cunning. And I certainly remember as a small child, there was a Scottish gardener in one of the other properties up here. Yeah. And he used to just grow what he wanted to eat. And then the owners just had to deal with Brussels sprouts, if that's what he wanted to grow. <laughs> that's uh, hilarious. So, so that sort of thing, uh, you know, the gardeners were really in charge. I mean, mm. but, you know, there would have been, I guess, from the big house, certain requirements put mm. in. And... Obviously, it would be mainly summer vegetables and summer fruit and things that they would be Salad angling greens. for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so that's the sort of stuff that would have been grown. But certainly there would have been veggies grown for all year round because the other staff would have lived out of the garden. Ah, so well. that was my next question. So the gardeners would have been here all year. Oh, yes. Regardless of the fact that the owners would only be here for a couple of months a year, perhaps? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you do have to manage a property like this. So mm. you would need to have staff here all year round to do that. Mm. And, of course... You can't have summer greens and summer fruit if somebody's not planting them in the winter or the early spring to get them going 
for that time. So of year. true, so true. Mm. And also just the scale. I mean, this is just the vegetable garden yeah. and the greenhouse and the berry bed. It's enormous. I mean, this would be a hard task for one person. It would. In fact, it's probably on a scale that is about twice the size of the average suburban allotment mm. without, in fact, a house sitting in it. Yeah. So it is quite a large vegetable garden, but they would have not only had the family up here during the summer, of course, they would have had visitors that would have come. Mm. They, people would have arrived for an afternoon soiree and a Devonshire tea. As but, I would have loved to have done. Yeah. They, they might have gone horse riding around the bridle tracks of Mount Macedon. They would have had tennis parties here, croquet parties. Stephen, you you're know. painting a magical picture of an era long gone. Yeah, it is a magical picture of an era long gone, but knowing me, I'd have been the gardener. <laughs> <laughs> it's in your genes. Well, I have loved this, and that greenhouse is just the most romantic of structures. And, and I just wish there was some way I could make it mine or make one that yeah. looked like that. Yes, well, first you need a really large block of ground. And can one say a sizable income, as yes. Jane Austen may have said? Yes, exactly. Well, here we are in the mists of Mount Macedon at Alton House. What could we possibly do to top this, Mr. Ryan? Well, we probably won't. We'll go back to something of a more domestic scale, perhaps, we next will. week. And to see what we're up to, you'll need to hit subscribe because we do post every week and hit the notification bell and you'll know exactly when our missive pops into the ether. But until then, goodbye all and we'll see you next week. See you next week.